All right, fantastic. Well, thank you all so much for joining us on a uh, lovely Thursday evening. Um, I am on a trip with my family right now. We just got to a cabin in Idaho where we actually have snow on the ground. Uh, we've been able to afford this trip in part by saving money on haircuts, as you can probably tell during the COVID pandemic, and also by making what my wife and I think are reasonably decent financial choices over the course of our adult lives. Now then, the decent financial choices we have made have been things that we wish we knew when we were in high school, when we were you know, earlier in college, or what have you, because we'd be doing even better. Okay, we'd be doing even better probably. And my hope is that by the time this webinar is finished, you are on your way to a life of independent wealth and not necessarily luxury, but a life of being able to take care of the people and the causes that matter the most to you. So here's you now. And this is me when I was like 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Okay, money is really, really complicated. Okay, you're not really sure what a stock is, what a bond is, what a mutual fund is, how to invest, what to invest in, why it's important to invest, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Between now and when we're finished, okay, I'll give you some advice. We'll have this being you later if you apply what you learn during our time together this evening. So you might be asking, what will I learn specifically? Well, we're going to focus on three areas of managing money, managing resources, managing our wealth. First, we, we want to talk about how to think about your choices. Okay. We'll talk about how to think about your choices using the economic way of thinking. I teach economics at Samford University in Birmingham, Alabama, and I've been doing this now for, gosh, about 14 years and uh, have become, I think, a much better decision maker as, uh, as a result of studying economics. We're gonna learn, second, how to get rich with hardly any effort. Okay, and this sounds like a bit of a con, because I'm sure that you've all seen, that you, you're all familiar with get-rich-quick schemes. You probably know somebody who's in multi-level marketing. You probably also know somebody who's gotten into multi-level marketing, spent a few hundred dollars, and has nothing to show for it. Okay, this is really actually how to get rich, with hardly any effort so that once again, um, in old age and retirement, you're well positioned to take care of the people and the causes that matter the most to you. And then finally, I'll say a few things about where to find the kinds of tools that will help you. Because what we're doing tonight is an introduction to the management of money and not the full story. Okay. There are all sorts of great tools online from a lot of organizations like, for example, the Foundation for Economic Education that have been made available so that you can become a better manager of your money, a better manager of your time, a better management of all of the resources at your disposal. And there are three things specifically at your disposal that you manage. You manage first, your time. You manage second, your talent. You manage third, your treasure. And we're going to talk about each of these things because when people think about what they wish they knew about money before 20, they think about just the stuff that's in their wallet or they think about the stuff that they can spend using things like this, which is my, my credit card. <clears throat> there, uh, I think a more holistic approach to this considers not just the money in your bank account or in your 401k or stuffed in your mattress, but also how you use your time and how you, uh, how you use your talent. Importantly, how you develop your talent. So first things first, managing your time, okay? Jesus said, count the cost, okay? And Jesus is a pretty good advice giver. So when we think about how we manage, how we manage our time, we want, to do very, we want to think really hard about making sure we count the cost. And what exactly do we mean by counting the cost? We mean thinking about the next best alternative. So here's an example. What is the cost of a Netflix binge? We have all been in this situation. Next episode begins in five, four, three, two. What do you do? Do you watch the next episode or you do something else? How should you think about it? You need to count the cost. And specifically, you need to figure out what is the, what is the value of your next best alternative? What's the value of the next best thing you could be doing with that next hour or hour and a half or two hours or what have you? What we're gonna do is think about the cost of a Netflix binge, the cost of sitting around watching Netflix and just kind of doing nothing else. So consider three alternatives. First, first, you could sit on the couch and you watch Netflix and you earn zero dollars. 
Okay. So in the couch, you watch Netflix, you earn $0. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with this. Rest and relaxation are really important. Okay? Like I mentioned, I'm on a trip with my family right now. Um, I haven't checked my email all week. I'm not checking my email at all next week. Okay. I'm not going to be doing anything. In fact, I'm not going to be doing anything to earn money this week or next week. In fact, I'm spending enormous amounts of money. Um, because rest is really important. Rest, rest on a lot of margins is an investment in maintaining your sanity, which is I think particularly important during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and also just making sure, making sure that you're sharp, making sure that you're best. So the optimal amount, here's gonna sound like, an, like exactly like an economist, the optimal amount of time to spend vegging out in front of Netflix is not zero, okay? So the optimal amount of time to spend watching Netflix is not zero. Okay, because it's a way to rest, it's a way to relax, it's a way to restore. Okay, it might be a good idea. Or perhaps you could sit down and watch Netflix for four or five hours, or you could go work at an office job and earn $125. Or you could, instead of working at an office job for 125 bucks, you could earn $75 driving for a rideshare company like Uber or Lyft. So the opportunity cost of that Netflix binge is not zero. If you spend five hours watching Netflix during which you could have earned $125 at a desk job, then it costs you $125 to sit and watch Netflix for five hours. If your next best alternative, if your next best alternative was driving for a ride share, then five hours of Netflix would cost you the $75 you could have earned driving for net or driving for Netflix, <laughs> driving for Uber, or driving for Lyft. Now, I know what a lot of you are thinking right now is, well, we're in high school, okay? Um, we don't have the option of driving, for, of driving for, for Uber or Lyft. We can't get desk jobs because we don't have college degrees. Therefore, there's no opportunity cost. And, the, and, and as not clever as that might sound, that's really not the case. Um, the opportunity cost could be the $7.25 an hour you could earn working at Chick-fil-A in Alabama or working at an ice cream parlor or something like that. Okay, in which case $5, sorry, five hours of Netflix will cost you, let's see, what's that, $37.25. Or, and again, this is really important, you could be studying. And your time, the time you spend studying is time that you're spending investing in human capital. Okay, which are the skills that you need in order to get a good job so that you can be in a position to earn $125 at a desk job in lieu of watching Netflix or something like that. So even though you don't get paid to study, you will earn a return on investment in the form of the skills that you're acquiring by studying math or studying English or studying economics or studying whatever that will pay off at some point in the future. Okay, so you might've heard the expression, there's no such thing as a free lunch. There's no such thing as a free Netflix binge. And it's really important, again, to make sure that you count the cost. Okay. You should also count the cost when you're doing things like shopping. Bargain hunting isn't always a bargain. Okay, one of my favorite, uh, do I have it in the slides? Yeah, I do, okay. So one of my favorite, uh, uh, favorite installments of the comic strip XKCD um, has one person pumping gas and another person saying, why are you going here? Gas is 10 cents a gallon cheaper at the station five minutes that way. And he says, because a penny saved is a penny earned. And the caption I think is really revealing here. It says, if you spend nine minutes of your time to save a dollar, you're working for less than minimum wage. Here's an example of somebody who's bargain hunting maybe for toilet paper or something to that effect. If you count the cost and you recognize that your time is valuable, then spending an enormous amount of time looking for the quote unquote best deal may not be um, the best use of your time. When I was in high school, I worked at a music store. Uh, we sold CDs and tapes and things of that nature. And um, our prices were good, but they weren't as good as like Best Buy. And pretty regularly, people would come into the store and they'd look at what we have and would someone say, well, I can get this, you want $15 for this CD, I can get it for 14 at Best Buy. And often I would say, well, oh, yeah, I think you have to brave Morse Road traffic just to save a dollar on a CD. Is it really worth it? 
bargain hunting isn't always a bargain because again, your time is valuable. And the time that you're spending bargain hunting is time you're not spending doing something else that might not, or that might be a bit more valuable. When we think about bargain hunting, I also think too about um, extreme couponing, which is an interesting phenomenon if you're not familiar with it. Um, there's clipping coupons and there's being frugal, and then there's, there's extreme couponing, which is taking quote unquote bargain hunting to the level of almost like a, like a, like a blood sport. Um, <clears throat> where you have people who are always looking for the best deal, quote unquote, on usually very large quantities of different things. And I don't know if the show's still on. You can find clips from it on, on YouTube, but there used to be a show on uh, about extreme couponing and extreme couponers. And it would always have something, something like, you know, the, uh, a story about someone who goes and gets $500 worth of groceries for 50 bucks or whatever. Okay. And that sounds great. And it sounds interesting. <clears throat> uh, but it's not necessarily wise because from what I, from what I've heard of extreme couponing, is that everyone in everyone who does this extreme couponing has their own hoard or they have a stash of things like rolls of toilet paper and stuff like that. Okay. Now this might be fun. It might be a cool hobby, but it costs money to store the toilet paper. Okay. In that you're paying a mortgage and there's something else presumably you could be putting where that toilet paper is. And then further, it costs a lot of time, a lot of energy to find all of the coupons so that you can find what you might think is the very, 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 very best bargain. So bargain hunting, while fun, and bargain hunting, while frugal, is not necessarily always a bargain. Because once again, the value of your time is considerable. Okay, forget about groceries for a second. Let's say a few things about managing your talent, and specifically about developing your talent, how you might invest in yourself so that at some point in the future, you can, again, have the financial resources at your disposal that will allow you to take care of the people and the causes that matter the most to you. First, it's not enough to be smart. You also have to be wise. There are a lot of very, very smart people in the world who are not wise, and they've made, frankly, flat disasters of their lives. Furthermore, there are, a lot of, there are a lot of other people in the world who are not necessarily super smart, but they're wise, and they've made good choices, and in making good choices, they put themselves in very, very solid financial positions. So what we're doing from this point forward is an exercise in the wise management of our talent, the wise development of our talent, and then the wise management of our treasure. Now, 20,000 years ago, if you wanted to pick a job, it was easy. It was easy. You could be a hunter or you could be a gatherer. You could be a hunter or you could be a gatherer. Okay, picking a job 20,000 years ago, pretty easy. Because if you didn't hunt enough and you didn't gather enough, then you and all your loved ones starved to death. Easy peasy, you hunted or you gathered. Today, it's a little bit more complicated than that. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but fortunately there are tools out there that will help you pick a job and specifically that will help you um, identify the characteristics of the kinds of careers that you might be interested in. The US Bureau of Labor Statistics has um, published something called the Occupational Outlook Handbook. And in the Occupational Outlook Handbook, they include average salary, number of jobs available, and then projections for about the next 10 years or so for a variety of different careers. What I would encourage you to do if you have a smartphone is go into the app store and download the BLS Occupational Outlook Handbook uh, app so that at pretty much any time, in pretty much any place, you can figure out, okay, well, how much does this job make? How much does that job make? Okay, how many jobs are available in this field or that field or the other field? Here are a couple of, uh, couple of specifics, or a couple of specific examples. Food preparation workers. So once again, dipping ice cream or frying chicken. Um, not a particularly attractive career choice. This is generally an entry level job and they call it an entry level job because it doesn't really require much in the way of skills and it doesn't pay particularly well. <clears throat> Your median pay would be $23,730 a year. Uh, about 842,000 people work in food preparation. Yeah, 11.41 an hour. I mean, it's nothing to sneeze at necessarily, 
But <clears throat> this will give you kind of an idea of the career ahead of you should you say, I want to be a food preparation worker. Similarly, you might think about really, really fun jobs like acting. And acting is fun. Theater is fun. Music is fun. All these things are really, really fun. The downside of fun jobs is that there's usually a very high supply of people willing to do them relative to demand. And that's definitely the case with something like acting. Median pay in 2018, $17.54 an hour. The number of jobs available, 64,500 with little to no change between 2018 and 2028. So if you compare food preparation workers to actors, actors are gonna, actors make a little bit more money, but there are over 10 times as many jobs in food preparation. Is this to say that you shouldn't aspire to become an actor? Well, not necessarily. Rather, it's to say that if you wanna do something like that, you wanna go into it with your eyes wide open. And specifically in this case, you wanna know that there are not a whole lot of jobs and they don't pay particularly well. Now finally, let's consider economists. Okay. What about economists? Well, there aren't a whole lot of jobs available for economists in 2018, about 21,000 of us. Um, but between 2018 and 2028, the job prospects for economists are rising faster than average. Uh, typical entry-level education is going to be a master's degree. If you want to go into academia and be a college professor, you'll need a PhD. But um, the cost, the cost of training is, is significant, but the benefits are substantial. In 2018, median pay for economists, $50 an hour, $104,340 a year. Okay, and this is going to be true of a lot of different occupations, things like engineering and stuff like that. One way to think about this, as you're thinking about how you allocate your time, as you're thinking about how you're investing in yourself, is that in a lot of ways, the market is begging you to become a math person. Economists use a lot of math. Engineers use a lot of math. Stockbrokers use a lot of math. Financial analysts use a lot of math. Okay, um, Quantitatively oriented careers are generally growing a lot faster than average, and they're paying pretty well. But this, is, this, I think, is a really, really useful tool that will help you sort out different things that you're interested in and possibly pick a career track. So that's one way to think about managing your talent is investing in yourself by acquiring the skills you need in order to do whatever it is you want to do at some point in the future. How, you might wonder, should I develop talent? Once again, count the cost. Consider what we talked about earlier. Watching Netflix, the optimal amount of doing that is not zero. Okay. I watch a lot of TV. I've watched all of the Star Wars shows since getting Disney Plus for Christmas, for example. But you want to think about the fact that the hour, the next hour you spend binging on Netflix is another hour that you could have spent learning or like sharpening your math skills or sharpening your coding skills or something like that. And again, perhaps setting yourself up for higher earnings in the future. Let's talk about treasure. Because when people think about managing money and think about what they wish they knew about money, they think about stocks and bonds and 401ks and 403bs and things like that. And what I want to give you now is a handful of simple principles that if you follow them, once you get out, no matter what job you get, basically, once you get out into the job force, once you get out in, into your career, if you follow these simple principles, you will be a millionaire several times over. Okay, You'll never have to worry about money. And you'll be able, once again, to take care of the people and the causes that matter most to you. There are three different ways to think about your treasure. There's getting your treasure. There's guarding treasure. And then there's growing treasure. You get treasure. Well, one of the ways you get treasure is by working. Once again, you're very confused. If you make years of wise investment decisions, then again, you find yourself rolling in money at age 65 or 67 or 75 or whenever it is ultimately that you choose to retire. Um, <clears throat> I'm actually, so just going to put this on a bit of a personal note because uh, so my, I hate to be a bit of a downer here, but my grandmother actually passed away recently at age 91, um, lived a very long, very full life. And I keep mentioning taking care of the people and the causes that matter most to you. 
<clears throat> well, one of the things that mattered most to my grandmother was her grandchildren and her great grandchildren. So by making years of wise investment decisions and knowing she can't take it all, she can't take it to the grave, she was able to save up enough money to um, be able to contribute at least a modest amount to our kids, uh, our kids' college funds. So when people think about managing money, managing money wisely, managing money, whatever, um, <clears throat> it's not necessarily so that you can buy the latest and greatest everything. It's again, so that you can take care of the people who matter most to you. How to work, how to work. Well, okay, how to work, gotta work hard, <clears throat> gotta work smart, you gotta work on the right things. This is fairly straightforward. <clears throat> um, what the Occupational Outlook Handbook helps you do is figure out what other people actually are willing to pay for. That's really important. You've got to figure out. You've got to do things that people. Um, you got to do things that people are willing to pay you to do. You have to do them well, which again is going to require a lot of, which is going to require that you work in a very hard, very, uh, very focused manner. <clears throat> and then, moreover, you're going to need to work smart. Um, one of the major challenges that your generation has coming up with with eye products and things like that is instant access to like all of the information that the human species has ever put together and avoiding the siren song of that information so that you can work hard on the right thing is really, really difficult. Moreover, defining exactly what is the right thing is something else, something else that's really, really hard to do. Okay, so working smart Working smart means thinking very, very hard about exactly what you're doing and what you're giving up, what you're willing to give up or what you need to give up in order to do it. Okay, I don't have a whole lot of time to talk about this specifically, but I recommend a couple of great books uh, on this. One is David Allen's book, Getting Things Done. Another is by a friend of mine named Jason Womack. It's called Get Momentum, How to Start, or it's actually by Jason and his wife, Jason and Jody Womack, Get Momentum, How to Start When You're Stuck. Okay, and that'll help you think about the work you're doing. And indeed, going to school is work. Studying is work. These things are going to have a pecuniary return. Uh, these books will help you think about this in a fresh, new, and I think much more interesting and useful way than you probably already do. Second, how to shop. Okay. Well, we spent a little bit of time talking about, um, talking about bargain hunting and things of that nature. <clears throat> I shopped very foolishly in high school and college and graduate school. And, uh, you know, even, even, af even after that, um, I didn't appreciate the value of a brand name. So in shopping, um, the lowest pecuniary price, the lowest money price might actually be a little bit misleading. What you want to do is you want to get the combination of price and quality that is right for you. And that might mean paying a slight premium in order to get the slightly better product. Now then, so I, um, <clears throat> as part of the, the coronavirus pandemic, I had to uh, teach my classes online for the second half of the semester. That meant I was making a lot of videos and doing a lot of webinars. So I went ahead and bought a, a pair of iPad, iPad, um, Apple AirPod Pros, which were like 250 bucks. I mean, so not, not cheap by any stretch of the imagination, but I was willing to pay extra for the Apple product because I have... I have an iPhone, I have a MacBook, I have a Mac at home, things like that. Knowing that they would integrate seamlessly with the products that I already had was worth a lot to me. And moreover, knowing that, uh, knowing that I had uh, the Apple brand name standing behind them was also worth a lot to me uh, in light of the fact that it was, it was a very, very serious situation in which producing high quality video in a relatively short period of time was at a premium. Okay. So I'm throwing a lot of information at you here, how to shop, what we said earlier about bargain hunting. And then second, think about how what is cheapest may not always be the best deal in light of your goals and in light of your values. Guarding your treasure. Okay, well you guard your treasure, um, you guard your treasure with insurance. And this is something that won't be an issue for you until uh, you're probably into your first job or until you're off your parents' insurance. But you buy insurance in order to get payments, okay, in order to get payments in the event that something terrible happens. So um, 
One of the best fields to go into right now is actuarial science. And what actuaries do is they estimate using information on mortality and stuff like that, the probability that someone with a particular profile of characteristics will die. So I'm 41 years old. Uh, I'm a little overweight. I need glasses. Um, I'm not a smoker. You know, this whole huge list of things. And insurance companies know or that can estimate that some fraction of the population of 41 year old males who don't smoke and are a little overweight is going to die every year. They can get a pretty good idea of how, of what percentage of us will, will kick the bucket, but they don't know which specific ones. We're able to guard our treasure by pooling risks via insurance so that we all pay in. And in the event that something really bad happens, say to me, or something really bad, say, happens to somebody else who's 41, a um, little bit overweight, doesn't smoke, uh, <clears throat> they, get, uh, they get a payout. Okay. Now, why would you want to do this? As I mentioned, I'm on a trip with my family right now, and that matters a, whole, that matters a lot to me. So being able to take care of, again, the people that matter the most to me is really important. That's something that you're going to need to think about, um, <clears throat> maybe not so much now, but once you get into your 20s and beyond. You also need to guard your treasure against inflation. <clears throat> and inflation, inflation, it's been said, is the cruelest tax. And indeed, it is a tax because inflation reduces the value of the money in your pocket. Okay, it reduces the value of the money, the money in your checking account. It reduces the value of the money in the seat cushions of your couch. And it transfers that purchasing power to the federal government. Now, <clears throat> Um, there are a lot of ways to guard against inflation. And one of the ways, one of the best ways to guard against inflation is to make sure that you have your assets in, is to make sure that you have your wealth in various interest bearing or appreciating assets. Inflation, Milton Friedman said, is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. And it is something that you're really going to want to keep in mind as you think about how to allocate your money um, how to allocate it between holding cash, between holding stocks, between holding bonds, between holding artwork, between holding any of a number of other things. Right now, inflation is targeted by the Federal Reserve System, or inflation in the United States anyway, is targeted by the Federal Reserve, which conducts monetary policy in order to try to keep the year-to-year -year increase in the consumer price index at about 2% per year. Okay. So the Federal Reserve tries to manage the money supply by conducting what are called open market operations in order to, uh, in order to target an inflation rate of about 2% per year. Okay. And that's going to lead us in, that's going to lead us now into thinking about um, what to, or about why to save, when to save, and what to save with, with part of, part of, uh, part of the what to save with discussion involving the definition of money. <clears throat> okay, So we want to grow our money by investing it well, by investing it wisely, and specifically by saving as soon as possible. <clears throat> why, you might wonder. Why, do you, why should I save? Saving's not very fun. Spending money is fun. Buying stuff is fun. Okay, But consuming now puts you at a financial disadvantage going forward. Why? You might, why, you might ask, should you save? Well, for a couple of reasons. First, in old age, um, in old age and, and into retirement, your skills aren't going to be what they used to be. Okay? Your skills aren't going to be what they used to be. Second, there is a powerful return on saving. Okay? And specifically, a powerful return on saving early. So uh, one of my favorite, favorite sayings is an African proverb. It says, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is right now. So either right now or as soon as you enter the workforce is when you need to start saving. Okay. Why is that? Because over, over, over the years, compound interest goes to work for you or compound returns go to work for you. And relatively small amounts now can turn into relatively large amounts later. And how large? Well, okay, we can use a, a little mental trick called the rule of 72. 
And the rule of 72 says that if you divide 72 by the growth rate of whatever it is that you're, that you're looking at, then that's going to give you roughly the number of years that it's going to take to double. So let's suppose that we have, um, let's suppose that we put, put money in the stock market. We put a thousand dollars in the stock market at, <clears throat> um, you put a thousand dollars in the stock market at age 22 and it grows at 9% per year. So using the rule of 72, it's going to double, it's going to double every eight years. So at age 30, you have $2,000. At age 38, you have $4,000. At age 46, you have $8,000. At age 54, you have uh, $16,000. At age 62, you have $32,000. And then at age 70, you have $64,000. So compound interest, Albert Einstein is alleged to have said, is the most powerful force in the universe in part because it turns very, very small amounts initially into relatively large amounts later. When I was in high school, I think about, I think about what I wish I knew about money. Um, I lost $1,500 speculating on what I thought were hot stock tips. Okay, so high school was, oh gosh, let's see, age, so I'm 41 now. So about 25 years ago uh, is, is, is when all this happened. If this had doubled every eight years, this had doubled every eight years, then that would have been, let's see, what's that? 3,000, 3, 6,000, $12,000, okay? $12,000 had I invested the money wisely instead of the $0 I have now because I invested it foolishly. How, you might wonder, should I save? Well, there are a handful of different ways to do so. Well, you might think maybe I can save with unrefrigerated taco meat. Okay, and if you go to fee.org, you can find a really interesting set of cartoons called Common Sense Soapbox, featuring, you know, this character is Bob. And in one episode, he decides he's not going to use money. He's going to use unrefrigerated taco meat to try to make all of his transactions. And you probably have a pretty good idea of how well this is going to go. Imagine taking rancid unrefrigerated taco meat to the grocery store and trying to buy stuff with it it's probably not going to work very well. So saving or trying to transact with unrefrigerated taco meat is not going to work very well. Meanwhile, saving and transacting with financial assets like money, stocks, and bonds will be a whole lot better than taco meat. Okay, Why? Well, because money, stocks, and bonds, they don't rot, and they solve a handful of problems that unrefrigerated taco meat doesn't. So I'm going to say a few things about money, a few things about stocks, a few things about bonds, and then wrap it up. They're better than taco meat, but what are they? And why are they better than taco meat? Well, first consider money. Money has four functions. Money has four functions. First and foremost, money is a medium of exchange. Money is a medium of exchange. And it's a medium of exchange because it solves the problem of the double coincidence of wants. Okay. Money's a medium of exchange because it solves the problem of the double coincidence of wants. And that says, if you want to trade with somebody, then you have to bring to them something that they want. Probably not unrefrigerated, unrefrigerated taco meat. Probably not even necessarily the skills that you have. So <clears throat> um, if I were to go to the grocery store, for example, and say, hey, tell you what, if you fill up my grocery cart, I'll give you a one hour lecture about economics. They're probably just going to tell me to leave okay? because they don't really want an economics lecture there. What they want is perhaps a bunch of other stuff. Money has emerged in order to solve this problem of the double coincidence of wants, and it has served as a medium of exchange. Money serves as a unit of account. The second function of money is that money serves as a unit of account. Okay, Since it's useful as a medium of exchange, it allows us to calculate things like profits and losses and these profits and losses tell us whether we're using resources wisely or using resources wastefully. Money's useful as a unit of account. Money's also useful as a store of value. Money's useful as a store of value because it solves a second important problem, and that is the retention of value problem. Trying to save again with unrefrigerated taco meat? Well, unrefrigerated taco meat goes bad pretty quickly. Gold? doesn't go bad. Silver doesn't go bad. Copper 
doesn't go bad. They're useful, therefore, as a store of value. Okay, then finally, money serves as a standard of deferred payment. Money serves as a standard of deferred payment. So I showed you a credit card a minute ago. And um, uh, one of the cool things about a credit card is in some sense, it's a promise to pay with promises to pay. So I swipe my credit card, I get my stuff, and Hilton, Hilton, no, excuse me, American Express, they pay now knowing that I will pay them back or knowing that I'll pay them before the, before the, the bill comes due. And I'm going to pay them with money. And money is interesting because money is itself an IOU with a fourth function of money being that money serves as a standard of deferred payment. You want money not for its own sake because there's really not a whole lot you can do with it. You want money, rather, because you can exchange it for things. Because when someone hands you money, they're basically making a promise saying, if you come back to me with this money, I'll provide you with goods and services. So money serves as a medium of exchange. It serves as a unit of account. It serves as a store of value. It serves as a standard of deferred payment. And originally, money was commodities. Originally, what emerged as money was stuff like gold and silver. Okay, and it's not necessarily because people like had some sort of thing for gold or silver. Pardon me. Or because there's anything specifically, um, you, specifically um, special, say, about gold and silver. Rather, they just had some characteristics that made, it, that made them useful as things that could be used in exchange. So consider gold, for example. It's very easy to, uh, or has a very high value to bulk ratio. So gold is something people really, 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 really want, and they want it badly enough that relatively small amounts of gold are pretty valuable, which makes transporting it a, a relatively easy proposition. Money's, or uh, gold is extremely durable, okay? Gold is extremely durable. Gold is extremely malleable, which means it's, it's incredibly easy to work with. Um, as I understand it, you can hammer out a, a single ounce of gold. You can hammer into enough gold leaf to cover a football field. Okay, so it's very easy to work with. And it's also very easy to check the purity of gold. So it's very easy to assay gold, A-S-S-A-Y. Okay, you can check it for, it's, it's easy to check for purity. Okay, people like it a lot. So there's a, so there's a ready market for it. It's homogeneous. One ounce of gold is every bit as good as another. And that's why commodity monies tended to emerge or have tended to emerge historically. In the 1930s, in the 1930s, under uh, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, things changed a little bit and private ownership of gold became illegal. So the currency was still backed by gold. The currency was still backed by gold, but you could not redeem it for gold necessarily, unless you were a major player, or major bank or something like that. Then in the early 1970s, President Nixon closed the gold window completely and totally, totally took the U.S. off of anything resembling a gold standard. Okay, now the gold standard is a monetary arrangement in which the money is backed by gold, where if you have a dollar, then that literally means, or it should be as good as gold, it means you should be able to redeem that for a certain quantity of gold, okay, it used to be about a 20th of an ounce uh, many, 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 many moons ago. Now we have what's called fiat money, and fiat money is money because the government says it's money. Okay, it's money because the government says it's money. It's not money because it's useful for anything. It's money because the government says it's money, and the money will, and, and the government will accept it, uh, will accept it for payment of taxes. So fiat money is backed by nothing backed by nothing. It has no, I hate, to, I hate to use the word intrinsic, but it has no actual intrinsic value. Rather, it's just bits on a computer ultimately created by the Federal Reserve. So a minute ago, I mentioned that the Federal Reserve tries to target inflation by managing the money supply. And one way they manage the money supply is by conducting what are called open market operations. And an open market operation is a sale or purchase of treasury securities from the banking system. If the Fed wants to buy treasury securities, 
Okay, and in so doing, they, uh, they would reduce the in, they would reduce the interest rate by doing this. It would be this would be an example of an of an expansionary action. Um, if the Fed wanted to engage in an expansionary open market operation, they would literally just create new money out of thin air, and then use it to buy bonds from the banking system. So where does the new money come from? Literally, someone sits, enters it. <clears throat> Uh, few keystrokes on the keyboard. Presto, we have new money that the Federal Reserve has created, that the Treasury might have printed if it's uh, if it ends up being actual currency, and it becomes money because the government will accept it uh, will accept it for taxes. Now, then what's a stock? Okay, say a couple things about some more traditional financial assets, stocks and bonds. A stock is a share of ownership in a corporation. A stock is a share of ownership in a corporation that you can't spend necessarily, but that is nonetheless valuable. Why? Because if you own a share of stock in a corporation, then you have, uh, then you are part owner of that corporation and you're therefore entitled to a share of that corporation's future profits. So if you own a share of stock in Amazon, for example, you're part owner of Amazon, and you have a claim, you have a right to Amazon's future pro uh, Amazon's future profits. Okay, so see a couple of people are raising hands here. Um, I know that this is being moderated. Uh, let's see here. Let me go ahead and get through this, and then I'll answer questions at the end. So stocks are share of ownership in a corporation that entitles you to. Um, that corporation's future profits. It's relatively risky, but it carries a relatively high return. Conversely, a bond is a loan to either a firm or a government. A bond is a loan. So if you, if you buy a bond issued by Amazon, then you don't own Amazon, rather Amazon just owes you money. Okay, okay? And these have relatively lower returns, but they're a whole lot safer. In the case of the U.S. government, the government can't go bankrupt, okay? It will, it, if, if nothing else, it can print money to pay its debt. So we generally refer, refer to the rate on U.S. Treasury securities as the risk-free rate. Um, and if Amazon goes bankrupt, it's the bondholders who get paid first. So you might wonder, which stocks and which bonds should I buy? I'm good enough at economics to tell you that I have no idea. I have absolutely no idea, but I have this conversation virtually every time I get on a plane. What stocks should I buy? What bonds should I buy? <clears throat> well, you should not try to pick individual stocks. Rather, you should pursue a strategy of diversification. You should pursue a strategy of diversification, meaning that you should hold a lot of different stocks and a lot of different bonds Okay, because over time, historically speaking, the winners have tended to outpace the losers, okay? And you don't know necessarily which stocks are going to be the good buys, which stocks are necessarily going to be the bad buys going in. So it's best to have a diverse portfolio of assets, okay? Once again, which stocks and bonds should I buy? Like I said, I don't know. My advice? is to invest in mutual funds that target a stock market index like the S&P 500. <clears throat> so here's the specific piece of advice that if you follow it, will make you a millionaire upon retirement. In your first job, <clears throat> sign up for the company retirement plan. You can sign up for a 401k if you're in the for-profit sector or a 403b in the nonprofit sector. If your employer doesn't offer this, then you can go to a company like Vanguard or Fidelity and open an individual retirement account. The versions of these you'll want to invest in will be the Roth version, a Roth 401k or a Roth 403b or a Roth IRA, because you pay taxes on it now and then are never taxed on it again, which is a great deal when you're young because your tax rate is extremely low. And then you want to put, you want to, you want to contribute as much as you feel comfortable contributing to what is called a life cycle fund. And a life cycle fund looks at your targeted retirement date and is going to invest for you 
in a diverse portfolio of stocks, like the S&P 500, as well as a diverse portfolio of bonds. When you're young, it's a good idea to invest very heavily in, in stocks. When you're old, like my grandmother was until recently, it's a good idea to invest a lot in bonds because you're gonna be a whole lot closer to needing the money and you're not gonna be in a position to take a whole lot of risks. So when I was growing up, I saw these commercials for uh, a chicken cooker made by a company called Ronco. And uh, their tagline was set it and forget it. And that's the investment advice I give you right now. Okay, invest your money in a targeted life cycle fund, specifically that targets a stock market index like the S&P 500, and let the magic of compound interest go to work for you, and you'll never have to worry about money again. How might we know? Well, again, if we look at historical returns on the S&P 500, they've been pretty good. Okay. They've been pretty good. This is just the last several years. And even if you look at just the last several months where we had a bit of a dip as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, the S&P 500 is once again back up to and around an all-time high. The question you want to ask is, what is the next wise choice? You, you know what the next wise choice is by counting the cost. You know what the next wise choice is with respect to, your, with respect to managing your actual money by uh, considering the principle of diversification that I talked about just a little bit ago. And uh, by saving when you're young, and once again, if you do these things, you end up, uh, end up rich, able to take care of the people and the causes again that matter most to you. <clears throat> so like I said, this is the beginning of a conversation or the beginning of inquiry. For you, here's a handful of resources that might help you. The St. Louis Fed offers a budgeting 101 class. I personally use mint.com to manage my credit card accounts, my bank account, my investment accounts, and things like that. All sorts of useful things that you should look up, you know, ideally as soon as we're done here, and that will put you on the road to financial security and financial success. So with that, I know that Abigail has been monitoring the, the chat, the Q&A, and hand raising and things like that. I'm going to turn it over to you. And I'm happy to answer any questions that people have. Great. Thank you so much, Art. Um, oh, thank you. So the first question that we have is, does using banks make sense? Yes, it absolutely does. <clears throat> using banks totally makes sense. Because banks are... Banks reduce what are called transaction costs. So you wonder, what exactly does a bank do? Well, a bank takes money from depositors, then lends it at interest to people who want to borrow money, and they pocket a slight difference between the interest that they pay to depositors and the interest that they charge to borrowers. Now, what they do to earn that difference, what they do to earn that interest, is they select the good projects. So as a bank depositor, I may not know necessarily whether the guy who wants, to, who wants to build a sports bar down the street is a good investment or not. I effectively outsource that to the bank by depositing my money in the bank, and then they do those evaluations for me. <clears throat> Similarly, when we needed to borrow money to buy a house, um, putting together $200,000 or so just by like asking for loans from people on the street wouldn't work very well. Uh, the bank pooled the money, they assessed the risk, <clears throat> uh, the risk of investing in us in this case, and uh, earned again the difference between the interest they pay to depositors and the interest that they earn from uh, the people to whom they lend, to whom they lend money by uh, making it a lot easier and a lot safer for uh, people to find good investment projects. So yeah, by all means, absolutely use banks. Awesome. All uh, right. The next question is, do you still recommend investing in stocks now with the COVID outbreak or should we wait until it's under control? Uh, I would say absolutely. Absolutely. Start now. So there's something called the efficient markets hypothesis <clears throat> that says that um, at any point in time, at any point in time, the price of an asset reflects all publicly available information about that asset. So for example, right now, like we're using Zoom and 
it would be foolish, I think, to say, oh, look, everybody's using Zoom because of the COVID pandemic. Therefore, I'm going to go buy Zoom stock. Well, okay, not Zoom specifically, but there's probably nothing there that a bunch of Wall Street traders don't already know. So at any point in time, at any point in time, at any point in time, the value of the stock market, the value of the stock market reflects everybody's best estimate. So it's not clear that it's going to go down, it's going to go up or anything like that um, as things quote unquote settle down. So I wouldn't see, I would see no reason to, no reason to not get started now. What else? Uh, great, thanks. Um, and another question, um, any thoughts about motivating young people to follow a plan like you've suggested? Um, any thoughts? Yeah. So any thoughts about motivating people to follow, motivating young people to follow a plan? Um, just simply, just simply the fact that you will never, ever, ever have to worry about money. Believe me, worrying about money sucks. Okay. Let's take the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic as, as an example. Um, I count myself very, very fortunate, um, that in part as a result of choices that we've made over the years, that we were not on sort of the, the brink of destitution as a result of this. Um, <clears throat> I, know that, I know that thinking about thinking about your older self is really, really hard to do. Uh, I, have, I have three kids, they're age 11, nine, and seven, and they do all sorts of incredibly stupid things, <clears throat> just as I did when I was their age. Maybe one thing to think about, so I said here, what is the next wise choice? might be to imagine yourself at 41 years old and say, when I'm 41 years old, will I be glad that I did this? Okay. When I'm 41 years old, will I be glad that I smoked this? No, no, you won't be. And when I'm 41 years old, will I be glad that I drank this? No, nah, probably not. When I'm 41 years old, will I be glad that I put this money in the stock market? Yes, absolutely. Again, conditional on putting it in a mutual fund that's going to yield, um, it's going to give you instant diversification and it's going to provide a pretty nice yield. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, next question. Uh, should I invest in virtual currency and what about precious metals? Uh, yeah. So virtual currencies and precious metals. I don't know enough about virtual currencies to have a strong opinion about them. Um, and therefore I don't invest in them. <clears throat> uh, there's, and that, that's probably a pretty that's probably a pretty good um, pretty good rule of thumb. Don't pick specific investments if you don't fundamentally understand what they are. So I can't really say much about Bitcoin, Litecoin, and Ripple and things like that. Precious metals. Um, I used to own some precious metals in part just because I thought it was cool. As investment, as investments, I wouldn't do it now. Um, I sold all of my gold coins a few years ago. And if you want gold in your portfolio, again, you can get that with an index fund. Um, you can get that with gold, gold based mutual funds or silver based mutual funds or what have you. And the benefit, <clears throat> the benefit is that someone can't break into your house and steal your mutual funds. Um, the only reason I would think of, and this is probably a much better reason now in light of the COVID pandemic, the only reason I would think of to own a lot of like physical gold and silver probably would be if you think that civilization is about to collapse or something like that. Okay. So building Long story off short. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so building off of that, which platform do you recommend for investment? Um, a lot of them, there are a lot of them that are great. Um, I use, so I use mint.com to manage all of my accounts. So like I can get a snapshot of my net worth at any point in time which is cool because like it tracks my mortgage, it tracks my bank account, it tracks my, all of my retirement funds and yada, yada, yada. Um, I do business with TIA Cref because that's who one of my former employers did business with. I do business with Vanguard and I do business with Fidelity. Um, <clears throat> Fidelity because my current employer uses Fidelity. Vanguard because someone recommended Vanguard several years ago. And in fact, actually the guy who founded Vanguard is sort of the father of this diversified index fund portfolio based investing strategy. But I mean, they're all pretty good. They're all pretty good. I would say don't pay high fees. Don't pay high fees. Um, 
Why? Because uh, even the experts are usually wrong about the stock market. And I mean this. So if you, if you look, if you take expert stock pickers and put them up against a random number generator, it's not clear that the quote unquote expert stock pickers are doing any better than just randomness. So uh, I would, so my kids 529s are with Vanguard. I have a Roth IRA with Vanguard. My wife has a Roth IRA with Vanguard. Um, <clears throat> my employer sponsored retirement fund is with, is with Fidelity. I've been pretty happy with both of them, but I know that T. Rowe Price is good. Charles Schwab is good. Uh, Prudential is good. There are a lot of, there are a lot of firms, a lot of firms out there. I mean, you really can't go wrong. They have a lot riding on their reputation and they will generally treat you pretty well. All right, and last question. Okay. Uh, for the teen who will start college in the fall, where is the mm -hmm. best place to start investing? Teen who will start college in the fall, best place to start investing? That's a really good question. Um, either one with a Roth IRA, if you, if you have enough money to fund it. I think you need like $3,000 to do that. <clears throat> or I would say two, think long and hard about the kinds of decisions you're gonna be making in college and how those decisions might affect your future earnings. <clears throat> so I mentioned things that I wish I knew. I'll go all the way back. What you need to know about money before age 20. When I was 19, no, excuse me, wasn't 19 yet. I was about to turn 19. I was going into my second semester of college. I said, hey, you know what? I don't need a meal plan. It would be cheaper just to buy and cook my own food. Yeah, a little bit of thought later, I realized, and a little bit of thought in like 10 years later, I realized that that was, that was probably not a very good decision because shopping takes time. Preparing my own food takes time. I, I don't mind cooking, but it's not something, it's, it's not something I, I would like do for fun. Um, I would have been better served, I think, to have a meal plan and take the time and energy I spent cooking, shopping, et cetera, and use that to study more. Um, so maybe the best way to invest, if you've got a few dollars right now and you get ready to start college, would be just to make sure you have a meal plan. <clears throat> awesome, thank you. Well, I'm posting the feedback form for after having completed the seminar. It's different than the one you did at the beginning. Uh, again, it only takes a minute. Um, it'd be really helpful if you guys could all fill that out. Um, and with that, thank you so much for attending. Uh, and thank you, Art, for an awesome talk. Certainly. Thank you, thank you all for joining us. Um, I know I threw a lot of information at you very quickly. Um, I, I, I Google pretty easily. Or you can email me at art.carden at gmail. Um, I'm not going to be checking that. I'm not going to be checking my email again for probably another few weeks. But if you do email me sometime after June 1st, then I will definitely make sure I get back with you.